From the Bill of Rights Institute, Fabric of History weaves together U.S. history, founding principles, and what all of this means to us today. Join us as we pull back the curtains of the past to see what's inside. In our continued celebration of the 19th Amendment's ratification, Mary, Gary, and Aaron take a look at two iconic women from history who happen to be mother and daughter, Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley. They'll discuss how both women were icons in their own rights, with Wollstonecraft famously advocating for women's education and Shelley penning the powerful sci-fi classic, Frankenstein. How did this pair prove to be an empowering force in the early struggle for women's rights and equality? There is a saying that well-behaved women rarely make history, which for rule followers like myself is kind of a letdown. But it is interesting to think about some of the women who have come before us and really had a big influence on the women's rights movement. And this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. So we thought it would be interesting to explore some of these early feminists and how what their ideas were. And even though they were some of early, you know, early feminists that influenced the women's movement in the United States, how are they still, you know, a very much a product of their times? And how did their times empower them? Or how did their times hold them back? And the women in question are Mary Wollstonecraft and her daughter, Mary Shelley. There are so many women and throughout the, the story. And you mentioned the 19th Amendment. I mean, it's huge period of time. But I really like drilling down to these two, because as a classroom teacher, they appeared in not only our history curriculum, but also in colleagues' English curriculum. And and I always found it really having the the stories of these these two women, these two people, um, and their connection to each other was was really helpful. And again, from a classroom perspective, you know, diving into the history of it, but also the connection with the English language arts classes. And I mean, across the country, you're going to find uh, these two Marys uh, in curricula and uh, scopes and sequences. And it's uh, it's it's really a powerful way to take a look at some really big ideas uh, through the choices they made in their lives. Mm-hmm. And Wollstonecraft um, in particular, and just talk, thinking about um, the, the suffrage movement in America particularly because Mary Wollstonecraft was from England, um, but to for the American public, as the women's rights movement gained steam, so did the iconic uses of Wollstonecraft because up until a certain point, a lot of her views were seen as negative due to her lifestyle choices. But as the women's suffrage movement gave gained momentum, so did her writings, which is very fascinating that these two things kind of gain momentum. So Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft. So I first, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this. I'm first encountered Mary Wollstonecraft as a history teacher in Virginia, where we have, where she is featured for authoring a vindication of the rights of women. But um, like Erin was saying, she sort of had negative press for most of her life. And that wasn't actually her first important work. So I think it's worth pulling, going back a little bit to when she was actually alive and when she was actually writing and what was so remarkable about her and what she wrote. Okay, so Mary Wollstonecraft, as I said, she's usually known or she's usually mentioned for Vindication of the Rights of Women, which is published in 1792. But she actually, her first publication of note was in 1790, and it was a Vindication of the Rights of Men. And she was writing basically as a response to Edmund Burke, who was a a politician in Parliament in England, who wrote a very famous critique of the French Revolution. So in 1790, the French Revolution is going on, and the French Revolution is not like the American Revolution in that it goes a little crazy. So um, Edmund Burke was famous for saying, you know, this is for saying, you know, tradition and, um, you know, traditional institutions are important. That, so we don't end up like France, which is crazy. So the hereditary titles, property, established church, these are all good things. 
And Wilson, he's he's famous for his um, reflections on the French Revolution. And Wilsoncraft's response to him is basically saying, you know, these ideals of the French Revolution and this idea of reform is a good thing. So she, um, it's actually in the full title, addresses him specifically. And she attacks not only his arguments, but his prose, which I think is really interesting because Burke has this section where he defends the treatment of the French queen. And Mary Wollstonecraft does not like that section. And she says it's very gendered and sexist. Like, why are you just defending the mm. queen? So um, I think that's, I mean, that sounds like something that you might hear of even today. And her, this publication is actually extremely well received. It's published anonymously and it sells out in three weeks. But when it's publication, when it's published again with her name on it, then they start, then it's being attacked in the press because it has a female author which I think is fascinating. Well, I was going to say so fascinating because it's, she had r- responded to Burke saying, your description of Marie Antoinette is gendered and sexist. And everyone said, this is amazing, great write- writing when during the first edition. And then when the second edition comes out with her name, they all start critiquing and contrasting her passion with Burke's reason. And they are basically critiquing her in the same way that Burke has critiqued Marie Antoinette. Yeah. It appears, it, which I think is very ironic. It, it is. So as if, as if the actions or at least the argument itself, when taken on its own, gets one reaction, but then when the identity of the, a person is associated with it... A it, female right. identity. Right. It, it alters the, the perception yes. and the response to it is powerful. And also the whole idea of being a critique of the way things are uh, is, a, is right. a bold thing to say. Well, I think... Um, so again, the context here matters. It's 1790. Most women in Britain aren't writing anything political. And the French Revolution is really shaking people... Like there's big changes going on and the United Kingdom is very close to France. So they're watching it very carefully. So she, I guess, had enough merits in her arguments to receive, you know, praise for her arguments. But when it's, it comes out that it is a woman writer, it's, it's very interesting that it's when she starts, you know, they start throwing shade, you know, as, as the youth say. And this is a time when the domestic sphere was still very prevalent and so the idea that, quote unquote, the women's place. She was stepping was out of it. Yeah. At home. Absolutely. And that that's why growing up, um, girl, young girls were educated in things like socializing and sewing. Because that was within the domestic sphere. And so if it was in the sphere of men, that was the appropriate. But once it was associated with women and put in like that, that is outside the domestic sphere. And I think a lot of that... Cr- cheek probably lie there as well so i do think so again you normally associate mary wollstonecraft with the vindication of the rights of women so that's 1792 but she wrote this first and she had this reception to her work you know addressed to burke come first and i think that i don't know but it would be hard to say that it didn't factor into her publishing the vindication of the rights of women right so i think we'll we should maybe explore some of those big ideas when we come back from a break Hello, Fabric of History listeners. Join the Bill of Rights Institute and fellow educators this fall as we explore topics such as women's suffrage, the executive branch, and how to use Socratic discussion with your students. See link in show notes, and we hope you'll join us. And now, back to the show. So two years after Mary Wollstonecraft writes A Vindication of the Rights of Men, she writes The Vindication of the Rights of Women, which is her most famous work and where I first encountered her as a teacher back in my teaching days. So in A Vindication of the Rights of Women, she is saying that rights and educational opportunities, women need better education in order to be empowered sort of at large. They would be better wives, they would be better um, mothers, and they could even you know, have occupations if their education was better. And again, at the time, so an education for a woman or a girl 
in Mary Wollstonecraft's time was very, it was sort of domestically focused. So sewing and then sort of the, these pleasant arts of knowing enough French to get a husband or singing, playing music, but the sort of education that, you know, a young man would have was not the same. It was definitely not the same at all. So this is her, this is her big idea that she puts out there. And, um, she says, if you strengthen the female mind by enlarging it, there will be an end to blind obedience. So not just, so just education as a form of empowerment, not just sort of education for education's sake. So I think for us, like in the present day to think about educating girls the same way that educate, that we educate boys, I think it's very like kind of a little no brainer. But again, for the time, this was considered sort of a novel idea for her to put this forward and she actually so a vindication of the rights of women is read in the united states so the young country at that time and it's fairly well received and this concept that emerges after the american revolution of republican motherhood again goes to this idea of educating women so they can properly prepare their sons not their daughters but their sons to be responsible citizens so i think there is an acknowledgement that education is a way of empowering um and that she she really believed in and you know it's easy to say well she's right well because she is kind of right but um but it was for her time it was something that again that's not what people thought of as women's education at all I mean, contemplating education, right, in terms of is education something with a purpose or is education something that is is an equalizer? I think those are both two arguments or at least two interpretations or two pieces of how people look at education. And yet they're not always aligned with each other. Um, yeah. That that they're equalizers or that the and slash or that there's a purpose to them, to education and what that well, should look like. So even in Vindication of the Rights of Women, or Women, um, Mary Wollstonecraft has this very ambiguous comment because I, like you said, um, having, achieving a point and as an equalizer get so quickly correlated, especially on um, this subject so often, but don't necessarily coexist. And Mary writes in this in vindication of the rights of women this comment and it says let it not be concluded that i wish to invert the order of things i have already granted that from the constitution of their bodies men seem to be designed by providence to attain a greater degree of virtue i speak collectively of the whole sex but i see not the shadow of a reason to conclude that their virtues should differ in respect to their nature in fact, how can they if virtue has only one eternal standard? I must, therefore, if I reason consequently, as strenuously maintain that they have the same simple direction as that there is a God. Yeah, I wonder. So I know in, I um, wonder if to come out and say that, whether she believed it or not, would have been just a bridge too far for her time period. And that um, to just say, you know, having a, more opportunities in this sort of education that women receive is is really the starting point. I think perhaps that's, um, I don't know, but that's an interesting thought because I know that in the women's uh, suffrage movement or just women's rights movement in the United States, it's sort of how far, what do you ask for and how far do you go and how fast do you demand it becomes something that splinters people. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an interesting comment that it, it, it does, it's not on hearing it, it's not immediately clear where she stands on that. Right. And, and kind of like we kept saying and got the thing we go, keep going back to is that these are still women of their times, of the 18th century. And the decisions they made, what they wrote, was still strongly impacted by the world yeah. they lived in. And like you said, you know, that could have been approached too far. And that's why this was written. Well, I think, I know, and speaking of being a product of your time, so Mary Wollstonecraft um, she dies very young. She dies at age 38. So it was just a few years after publishing a vindication of the rights of women. And she dies from childbirth fever, um, because no one really knew how to help a woman have a baby back in the day. And she dies giving birth to a daughter who turns out to be another pretty remarkable woman that you, many people have encountered today. And that is Mary Shelley. So it's not too often that you encounter 
this mother-daughter relationship between two extraordinary women and in their own right. And then they usually appear, you know, in the curriculum for liter both literature and history. So Mary Shelley is, of course, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft. And Mary Wollstonecraft dies several days after giving birth to Mary Shelley. So she's not around for the upbringing of her daughter, but Mary Shelley goes on to be quite a remarkable woman in her own right. Mother, remarkable mother-daughter combinations, of course, abound, but it's interesting that they often span different subject areas. So you may learn in history about, about these combinations, but, but often, as you said, you might find Mary Wollstonecraft featured heavily in a history curricula, but Mary Shelley will appear heavily in a literature or English language arts class or something like that. And the connection across those two, um, I think, is really significant. Um, but you're right. I, I think it's often a misconception, maybe. I don't know. I'm speculating uh, that, you know, the, the, the influences of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft on Mary Shelley were because she raised her throughout her life. And, and that isn't the case. Right. So she she had passed away when Mary Shelley was born. She was born in 1797. Um, Mary Shelley lives lives a while. She lives until 1851. So she's seeing a really really powerful time in history uh, throughout the, the early 19th century, right? Um, and so uh, taking a look at the choices she made and and that she is born into a world where Mary Wollstonecraft is, is a significant person, uh, particularly being her mother, but also that the idea that they were both pioneers, that that Mary Wollstonecraft is a pioneer in uh, in the in, in the movement in feminism and writing, but Mary Shelley's a pioneer in that we know her from writing for a whole genre that doesn't exist yet, which is science fiction. Um, you know that 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 creativity, that that ability to to think about alternate worlds and and, and non realities is is super powerful. Um, so she, uh, the, the story, of course, that usually arrives is about, uh, is about Frankenstein, the writing of Frankenstein, who, of course, we're going to get some letters. It's the doctor, not the monster. <laughs> um, I literally her. didn't know this for the longest <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. He's just referred to as the monster or the mon the is it monster. monster with a capital M? I can't remember. It's been a while since I read it. But yes, anyway, that's neither here nor there. However, yeah. I the argument has been because a lot of uh, we're talking about humanity and humanity was a huge focus in this novel for Mary Shelley and saying that um, Dr. Frankenstein kind of get went against the grain in creating this monster of humanity and this monster and what happened was like the repercussion of going against like the natural grain of humanity. Right. So, of course. Yeah. And that's and that's often what's contemplated in English classes, right? Is it about exactly. is it about you know science versus nature? Is it about mm -hmm. hubris? Is it about and that's that's sort of the beauty of it. Um, you know, the story of of its coming about is is I think always noteworthy. Um, as a lot of people know, is in is in eighteen sixteen, and uh, it was during the year without a summer. That was that was something interesting to learn. Is that there's because of the eruption of uh, of the volcano of Mount Tambora. Um, the the climate was thrown off and it was just people were stuck inside it was you know I, imagine yeah. a world where you're stuck inside for an extended <laughs> period of time because of extenuating circumstances um <laughs> you know what what can you do uh and so you know a, as the story goes um they had been reading ghost stories which is you know extremely common and um and lord byron of course which you would also know from from our literature class uh proposed that they would have a competition and um According to what she said, it was sort of, it just, it hit her. Like she said, it was like a waking dream. It just, it just popped into her head, but, but that had to come from somewhere. And again, we're not going to speculate now where, but she has a lot going on in, in her mind, in her life, uh, in her life experiences, in the time she is in. Um, and so, and so she goes ahead and you're right. The, the idea of Frankenstein is a amazing concept of, you know, piecing together what is humanity and what is it to be alive on uh, everything like that. And everything that has come since obviously has, has altered it. Right. I mean, there's no, I think in our mind, there's an allusion to like, you know, electricity and machines, but that's actually not the, the book is actually slightly different. We've come to 
we've come to attach a lot to this concept that she wrote no about. No pun intended. Um, but it was really powerful. I mean, earlier on, you mentioned about the attaching one's name uh, to to it, particularly as a woman in the time. And she does. At first, she she writes it anonymously. Uh, and a lot of people think her husband wrote it. Uh, because people he's, still he's in- argue that today. Which is yeah, yeah. fascinating because to she me. included him in the in the beginning part mentions him and so people are like oh it must have he must have written right and he um, edit he helped edit her work but the argu- thing that's really interesting is that if you look at it number my number she edited a lot more of his work than right. the other way around but people have never argued that Mary Shelley wrote a lot of Percy Shelley's <laughs> literature which right. I think is. A, yeah, again yeah that's interesting yeah yeah and and in defense of the writing process it's not like she just it was a fully formed version of what we know today in that contest right it's something that she works on for a couple of years and and later versions are are she, she definitely polishes and and adds things into later versions that i think become the versions that we know today but throughout it are are really powerful thoughts that i think are are good in both history and literature classes you know about you know, how writing shapes thought uh, and how, um, you know, I mean, beyond the ethical questions there, there's there's the idea of of of, of feminism and literature and 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 creation. And it, it's just so staggering that she that she did all of that. I had not known uh, even in teaching that she actually went on to wrote write another novel called The Last Man, uh, who's about a survivor in a world destroyed by plague. I, I feel like I might pick wow, that one up. No, now I didn't know that either. Read it while I'm at home. So I think she's she's grappling with these really big questions and they're not questions that are specific to women and I think you could say the same thing for her mother Mary Wollstonecraft just the idea that education is empowering is not something I would argue that's specific to women it's an important idea that just merits discussion on its own so these two women are extraordinary and they're very intellectual and they have you know very impressive achievements I'm not writing novels being stuck in quarantine, you know, for instance, and grappling with the what does it mean to be a human idea? I'm just like wearing the same clothes every day. But um, but they, you know, they're they're impressive and they have these really interesting ideas. And even as you think about um, that, you know, that we should look at on their own because of the merits of what they had to say. And even I think with the women's suffrage movement, so the women, the 19th Amendment is be celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Um, It's just sort of the same thing. We shouldn't look at it because women got the right to vote. We should look at it because it was another step towards the promises of the Declaration of Independence, that we are all equal. We're human. And um, I think that that's something really powerful that these two particular women um, sort of embody. But they're certainly not the only two women, and we'll certainly be talking about, you know, other important women. So if you have any thoughts on Mary Shelley or Mary Wollstonecraft or Frankenstein or what to do in quarantine or anything from this podcast that you, you know, you left you with something to say, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you at comments at fabricofhistory.org. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Thanks Happy guys. reading, everybody. The Bill of Rights Institute engages, educates, and empowers individuals with a passion for the freedom and opportunity that exists in a free society. Check out our educational resources and programs on our website, mybri.org. Any questions or suggestions for future episodes? We'd love to hear from you. Just email us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. And don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to stay connected and informed about future episodes. Thank you for listening.